Okay. <laughs> Morning, everyone. That's way more people than I expected. Um, okay, welcome to um, this talk about uh, tech of gold. And you might wonder, what is gold? And first of all, it's a working title of an upcoming Blender Open Movie project. In case you missed announcement, we didn't make too much buzz about it. So um, we'll do, I think it, with, the, with the past project out of the way, we'll keep like posting much more. Um, so the story-wise, it uh, goes into those exploration of experience of how fragile we are and how resilient we can be uh, through um, transformation adaptation to the changes. On a creative level, uh, this movie is about uh, utilizing the impressionistic style and being a visual poetry type of thing. Um, so here are just a few examples from early concepts and uh, early renders of how we think movie could like or should look like. And the uh, world consists of um, several parts of it, like underwater, some uh, uh, above the water part, underwater part. And you can already see that it's quite different from what we were doing so far with uh, more photorealistic movies at, at Blender Studio. And if that's not enough, movie goes even deeper. Um, something we call a beast. I would not go into more details just yet. Um, it will come back a bit later, but yeah, you can see how it could be challenging for the um, realistic rendering pipeline. So for us, it was clear, okay, so we need to have more closer collaboration between developers and the art team, which for previous project wasn't that close as we would hope so. For this, it, we said, okay, we need to sit together. So we did sit together with the, all the creative people around, with directors and render team and all the other uh, Blender developers. And I think we came up with a plan, and it was literally called Plan.txt out of that meeting. Um, so what it is about, so we highlighted a few topics which we would need to work on um, for in, in a couple of different areas. Uh, so for cycles, it, uh, the lighting and normal controls w would be, was requested like that was on a, a number one priority. And also something which came up later is the uh, brush stroke rendering. And uh, there are a few uh, topics for the compositor, even though it's not really clear how exactly we'll break down like what's being around the time and what's being done in the compositor, but we want to be ready for either of the choices. And at this uh, moment, I bring my colleague who we work together a lot, Brecht. Please welcome him. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about uh, the cycles rendering part uh, first. And so, uh, so one of the, the feature requests uh, the things that, that we thought we would need was the, the light linking. Um, I mean, this is not just like a request from the Open Movie Project. We've known for a long time that this is a, like one of the, the highest feature requests from users as well. So, um, you know, we thought we can just solve both of those at the same time. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, the, the motivation for this particular movie is that, you know, it's stylized and so you want to be able to do more tricks with lighting, you know, selectively apply it to certain things. Um, and, uh, and just sort of be more artistic than just trying to do like pure physics simulation. Um, so that's sort of the motiv motivation for this open movie. And so what this feature is, uh, it's, it's basically two things. It's light linking and shadow linking. And light linking, it means that you can say for this light, I want to affect just these objects in the scene uh, and, and, and nothing else because you might want to add like a rim light to like one character, but you don't want like a rim light on the entire environment. You just want to make the character stand out, for example. Uh, and then shadow linking is kind of something that you need once you have light linking, you know, so I also need shadow linking because if you're, say, adding a rim light to one character, you generally don't want, like, the environment to block that rim light as you're, like, affecting that one character. So you want to be able to exclude certain objects uh, from casting shadows for certain lights. And so uh, the user interface for this uh, is, you know, as in the screenshots, basically, on a light, you can set a collection, and that collection contains uh, an arbitrary number of objects or an arbitrary number of collections, and that you know that defines like these are the number, these are the objects that uh, the light affects, or alternatively, you can just exclude ones and say you know don't affect these like exclude this just this one object. 
Um, and there's been like lots of discussion uh, before on like light linking, how should it work? Uh, we went with this way um, for two main reasons. Like one is it's sort of the industry standard way of doing things um, that we know works. And that means you can like export it to USD potentially. And like it's sort of compatible with other renders that might want to integrate with Blender. And the other reason is that the reason to put it on the lights rather than say on the material as it used to be like with the old shadow linking in Blender internal is that if you're setting up a shot, then generally it's more convenient to customize the lights and just add a bunch of stuff to them rather than add a stuff, bunch of stuff to your objects in the scene because then you need to do a bunch of overrides and it gets really complicated. And so that's, that's sort of the motivation for that. And this is sort of then like a very simple programmer art example of, of light linking. Um, so there's like a white light that just affects like the entire scene. And then there's a yellow light behind the ground that's uh, lighting like the, the two monkeys from below. And like the, the ground is not, not casting shadows for that. Um, and then there's also like a red light on the one monkey and the green light on the other monkey. I mean, this is just sort of what you can do. Um, and now we'll go into like the, the implementation details more or less. Um, so there's two sides to this, like there's one part on the Blender side, and there's a part on the Cycle side. And so on the Blender side, uh, we involve the dependency graph to do uh, a certain work. So the way it's specified, it's on the light object, but for rendering, you kind of want the data on the receiver object or the shadow blocker object. Um, and so we kind of have to invert that relationship, and that that's what the dependency graph is kind of good at. And uh, we want to make it into like a, a format that's really efficient to evaluate at render time, um, and that can work on a GPU. And so the basic idea is to use bit masks um, to do really quick comparisons. And so for this, what we do is we, we find like um, all the unique sets of lights that uh, surfaces or shadow blockers in the, in the scene might use. So certain receivers might use this five set of lights and other receivers might use these seven lights. And we sort of try to figure out like all the unique sets that exist that, that, that might uh, affect the, the receiver or alternatively a uh, shadow blocker. And then we assign a bit, uh, a bit to uh, each of these sets and uh, that then becomes a bit mask. Uh, and that's like a bit mask comparison. It's like a really simple operation, very quick operation um, that we can then do uh, in, in, in the rendering. Um, so yeah, that's that's a very quick way of just saying, I'm mean, on this shading point, I have this light, do they affect each other or just do a comparison and then, you know, you know, yes or no. Um, so that's easy to do that bit mask comparison, but it's not ideal yet because it's kind of inefficient um, because you might pick a light uh, for shading a certain shading point, but it might not actually have any influence. And if you've traced the pad all the way up to that point and then you say, well, uh, there's no influence, it's kind of a waste, right? It's like, it's just a wasted sample. And so what we do is uh, we have an optimization when you use the light tree where for every set of lights, uh, we build a specialized tree. So we first start by building, maybe I should explain what the light tree is because it's a relatively new feature, but the light tree in cycles is basically, it looks at all the lights in your scene and it puts them in like a big tree structure. So I can quickly figure out like I'm here in the scene. So like these lights that are nearby are likely to have an effect, you know, on the shading point. So then we can quickly look them up. And so in order to make the sampling efficient for this light tree, um, we first build like a light tree over all the lights in the entire scene. And then for every set of lights, um, we build a specialized tree. We build like, we take just a subset of the tree that's uh, relevant for that particular type of light set for that set of receivers. And uh, yeah, we, we build a smaller tree from like the big one. Um, and we have some tricks because the point of light tree is sort of that you can have like millions of lights in a scene potentially and render them efficiently. And so we don't want to like have, if there's like only sole differences between certain surfaces, we don't like want to have like one light tree with like a million objects for this one and then another for like this one with another million lights. And so we have this trickery to like share certain subtrees of like the entire thing between like different, uh, between different light sets when it's possible. So that allows you to have like potentially like millions of lights in your scene and and dozens of like different uh, light linking configurations and still like have reasonable memory usage. Um, so that's the idea behind that. And then the shadow linking was actually the more challenging part. Um, 
So conceptually, it's pretty simple. You say I trace the ray from the shading point to this light, and we're just going to filter out some objects. We're just going to ignore some objects with a bitmap. You know, you hit the object, and you say, well, is it relevant? And then you, you know, you might just skip it. Um, but there's a complication in that in cycles, we, uh, from the beginning, we had sort of this assumption of physically based rendering, which allows us to do a certain optimization um, that a lot of other renders have started doing as well. Um, but it doesn't really work when you do shadow linking. So, um, so, so I should explain. So for direct lighting, there's this thing called multiple important sampling. Um, it's very technical, and I'm not going to go into the math. But basically, uh, you have two strategies for sampling a light. Like one is you're at a shading point. I'm going to pick a point on my light. I'm going to make a connection. Does it and then and, and uh, that you know you 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 give the influence of that to uh, to the shading point. Um, that works well if you have a small light and you have like a diffuse PSTF uh, that renders with very little noise. Um, but then if you have like a very specular BSDF or like a large light, it stops kind of working. Um, and so we have a second strategy where Basically, if you do an indirect light bounce, you might incidentally also hit, you know, a light where I might just hit the beam. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, like you might incidentally hit a light just like you might hit some geometry. And that's sort of your second strategy. And that second strategy is a problem for us because we kind of did the trick of like combining like indirect lighting and like the second light sampling strategy. Um, we just trace one ray because it's sort of the same thing physically. But I mean, there's no difference in, in physics. But when you start doing light linking tricks, you kind of have to make a distinction between this indirect light and this like light shadow linking. And so uh, basically what it means is instead of tracing two rays, we now need to trace three rays when you use shadow linking sometimes, which is a bit more expensive. And it adds a bunch of complexity to the kernel. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's what we did. Um, how that works exactly is uh, it's too long for this, this talk, but basically, uh, we had to do like a whole bunch of refactoring in the kernel and it was like a very complicated thing, but we got there in the end. Uh, and so now, yeah, sometimes we trace three rays instead of two uh, if there's shadow linking. Um, so th the basic feature is there in Blender 4.0, but there's still more work to be done. Um, so the main one is the user interface, I would say. Uh, so in other applications, you have this view, usually you have this interface where you can view things either from like the, the point of view of the receivers or the point of view of the emitters and you can sort of have this specialized editor to set up the links. We currently just have this in the properties panel, which is okay, but it's not, it's very flexible, but it's not like uh, necessarily the most intuitive. Um, so we do want to still add like some sort of editor that gives you like a global overview of all the light linking in the scene and then make the connections. Um, another limitation is that there's no light linking for the world at the moment, and we would like to solve this basically by uh, implementing another feature that people want, which is adding like a dome light type, so you can have basically multiple world lights in your scene and you can rotate them, which is usually there in other renders. Um, and so if we add that, we would automatically get kind of world, uh, light linking for worlds. Um, another thing that's been requested is that, okay, this is for direct lighting, for indirect light. There's this concept of trace sets in other renders, which is kind of similar, but you define collections for like uh, for which objects are in the indirect light. Um, so that would be a good extension to this. Um, the other thing is EV supports, of course. Um, the nice thing is that some of the stuff is on the Blender side, so that can be shared between uh, cycles and EVs. So hopefully, that will make things faster. Um, and then the last point is like better integration with USD and external renders. I mean, I know some external renders already have their own light linking thing and they might continue to use it or they might switch over to the Blender native thing. Um, we'll see what happens there. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the light linking. Um, and then there's a second uh, cycles thing, um, which is a lot more vague. Um, basically, it's not, it's normal control and sort of more general, um, you know, stylized shading in a way. Uh, so this is an example render where uh, the normal isn't really just like, uh, or I don't know if this is a concept art or a render, it starts, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell. I think this is, uh, um, but uh, basically for like a painterly style, like one thing you might want to do is sort of make your normals flatter, make them more planar in certain areas. Um, so it's more like, you know, brush strokes, which, which tend to be flatter than 
having this like really smooth gradient. Um, and so, yeah, you, you might uh, do all kinds of tricks, or you might have add this sort of, you know, surface detail along the shadow edges that, um, you know, make it sort of jaggy or, or apply some sort of texture pattern uh, to make it look more interesting. Um, and normals are a big way of, like, controlling that kind of thing. Uh, so, okay, so it's easy to set a different normal, but then for the renderer, it's, uh, it gets kind of tricky because you have your real geometry and you have your fig geometry, uh, your real geometry and your fake normals, and they're not the same thing. And if you just, you know, use the fake normals, you get all kinds of rendering artifacts. Um, like some of them uh, were much worse before, um, but we've solved like a bunch of them now, but this was like more in the context of like realistic rendering. Uh, and in stylized rendering, it's a little different um, because there's not like one correct result necessarily. It's like you're doing something that doesn't really have like a physical equivalent. So um, we kind of have to figure out a bit what, what we want to do there or what it even has to look like exactly. So I'll just briefly talk about like the existing stuff that we do to compensate for like this discrepancy between the fake normals and the real geometry. Um, this, all this stuff is basically aimed at uh, trying to guess like this is what it would look like if you, your, your surface was actually that smooth or there was actually this like displacement detail there um, while, while, the surf while the geometry that we have is actually just flat. Um, so there's, there's three, three tricks that we use. Um, one is if you have smooth normals uh, along like a low, low poly geometry, uh, we kind of pretend that uh, the shading points is actually on some sort of virtual smooth geometry. Like, so we kind of look at the normals and then we compute like this is, it's like the top image, like it's this green thing, it's sort of, but we're pretending the surface is, and we kind of move the shading point to the fake smooth geometry and that avoids a bunch of like self intersections and things that, um, that don't look good. The other tr two tricks are for bump mapping. And so uh, we distinguish two cases. One is the diffuse bump mapping um, where as you can see, it's in the second image, like your hemis hemisphere should be like fully above the surface, but here it's bump mapped. So it's like tilt slightly below the surface, which means like some of the rays might just go below the surface as well. And this, uh, especially like where the cutoff point is, you get these like really sharp um, artifacts, like the Terminator problem. Um, and the trick we do there is based on a paper from, uh, from Disney, I think. Uh, but it's a trick that goes back a long way in different variations. Um, and basically what you do is you kind of pretend, okay, we're going below the surface. Like we're probably like on, on this incline and this means we'll probably have some extra shadowing anyway from all this like detail on the surface. So we just kind of like in this region add some extra artificial shadowing to sort of cover up um, the artifacts that you would otherwise have, which in one way is a trick and other way you can like justify it like with micro facet uh, shadowing theory. Um, and it looks, uh, and then it sort of looks like a, a real, real surface with detail more or less. Um, and the second trick we have is for specular uh, bump mapping. Uh, and there you get the problem where, okay, if you're looking at the surface right on, it's, it's, it works pretty well because the ray is just gonna come back. But like, if you look at a grazing angle, the ray might actually like dip into the surface as well. And so we do a little trick there where we kind of pull back the normal a bit um, so that the ray actually like stays above the surface. Uh, and that works pretty well. And so those are like the tricks we have now. Um, and then the question is, what are the tricks for this realistic, uh, for the stylized stuff? And we don't really know yet. Um, so we're still trying to figure out with our team, like what exactly the look is what, that they want, which changes we need on the cycle side to accomplish this. Um, so it's still very much up in the air, but we made some initial changes like uh, Wayzan did some work on improving the bump mapping correction that we have, like the, the last two things that I mentioned, um, just to make it more correct and more consistent. And it also fixed uh, some cases for like realistic rendering case, which is nice. Um, and the other thing is that we had the control to disable all these bump mapping corrections in case you say like this stuff, I, I don't care about this stuff. Um, and so the vague ideas we have to, uh, to do, to make it work better for stylized rendering, if we even need to do them, it's, it's sort of unclear at the moment. Um, one of them, one of the ideas is to just say, uh, my normals locally, they have no uh, 
like relation to local geometry. So I'm just going to like ignore local shelf shadowing and like only far away objects. I want those to cast a shadow and like the local stuff, you just ignore it because there's no, no relation. Um, that would be one trick. Another thing is that other renders have these things called light filters. Uh, there's things you can do very similar to light filters and light shaders, but there's a few limitations. So we're thinking um, if necessary, we could uh, improve the lights uh, shaders to add a few more features for artistic control. Um, and then there's some things with ray tracing visibility that uh, where you want to do certain tricks and it's there's some limitations in the ray visibility uh, that, that currently make those tricks difficult. And actually with like the shadow linking changes, we can now make those work better. Um, so that's another thing that we're thinking about. Uh, adding, uh, making the ray visibility work better for this case. But this is all very vague, so uh, we'll, we'll see what we end up with. Um, but yeah, that's what we're thinking about currently. And uh, yeah, that's the end of my part. So, thank you. So now we're going into even more fuzzy territory. Because before it was like, yeah, okay, so there are some solutions. Um, so uh, it's a, it <clears throat> the nature of the movie is that it should all be consisting like of, the, of the pain strokes. No, no, that's the look we're looking for, uh, like trying to achieve. So we need to render those strokes. And uh, here is the comparison of the uh, concept art uh, and the early render based on that concept art. And in the uh, right hand corner, we can see zoomed in version on, on the corral. And the basic idea here is like, okay, so all the surfaces get broken down into individual strokes um, and strokes get from uh, Atlas, which was created based on actual making brushes on image and scanning them and putting them to Blender magic from Simon, I believe, of course, great. Um, so that's roughly idea of, of, of uh, how it could work. Um, now, the, there are some challenges. So like all the surfaces gets broken down into those strokes, right? But we also want to give the control to the uh, animation department or like if they need to add something, uh, add the animation set to emphasize something. So it should be super easy for them to add extra strokes to the, uh, to the final frame and during animation. And when we started having all those discussions, the only uh, available uh, feature in Psych and Blender was Gris Pencil, Gris Pencil 2, I believe it was back then. And it had very limited uh, control over shading. So we could do some stuff, but not really. And the idea which we had back then is to can be able to convert uh, Gris Pencil strokes to meshes, and then you can uh, benefit from all the features available for shading and, and distortion with geometry nodes and in cycles. Luckily, there is a Grease Pencil 3 project going on, which already have some uh, support of geometry nodes. And for, for that, I would actually refer to the talk from Falk from yesterday. And yeah, so with, with Grease Pencil 3, it's already possible to, to achieve what, what was needed to, to convert to meshes and more seamless integration into uh, cycles. There are still some topics open, I believe, like how, uh, like if you add uh, strokes on top of existing geometry, we want to somehow more uh, easily transfer shadings to, 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 to the stroke and go from there. So you don't need to start from scratch with the shading for every stroke you add. Um, so that kind of brings us to the next step. So if you really want to finish Chris Pencil 3, make it available for everybody outside of experimental feature. Um, but it's also, if all the surfaces get broken down into the strokes, it's becoming a lot of a challenge for the memory consumption for rendering. So one of the ongoing discussions, like, okay, how can we make it more efficient for rendering? Can we bake something? But then baking in Blender is very fun to use. <laughs> <laughs> So there is some ongoing um, development discussion of, about like what needs to be improved for, for, for this specific case because you can go very, very deep just from, from blend, uh, baking in Blender and we want to have enough room for the more important topics if they come for the, for the movie and for the regular development. And the other aspect which keeps coming is the pigment-based mixing and not just light-based mixing. And that's... Uh, uh, Simon did early prototypes with geometry nodes, I would imagine. It works pretty well. Um, 
for the technical demo type of a thing, it doesn't feel like it's sounding, I would be really comfortable giving to all the animators. So it feels like we could do much better integration with, with tools there and maybe some uh, render or shading somehow. I don't know, it's, it's all ongoing. We'll see where that goes. Um, and yeah, here we can see the results of the early uh, pigment-based mixing. Okay, so now we go into more fuzzy territory. Well, maybe even more clear. Depends how we look at it. So because it's still not really clear what, uh, what will be the exact breakdown of what is being rendered painterly and what we cheat as a post-process, uh, painterly filters in Compositor was uh, one of the uh, topics we were looking into. And it's basically to either remove details from the background or um, give more like facety look to, to, to the shading as a post-processing step. Because what if you know, all the rest doesn't really get feasible because of render times or memory consumption or other aspects. So there are just a few examples of like where we think it could work. So what we did is we added Kohara filter to our compositor system. And what it does, it's quite self-explanatory. It just converts something more realistic into more painterly. Um, and it does it uh, in a way that it preserves uh, edges and overall shape of, of the object in the, in the scene, in the, on a frame. We also added variable control for the radius, like how much painterly things become in a local area, which gives you ability to control, okay, so I want more painterly look in a background or a foreground or vice versa. So that's all under artistic control. And surprisingly, it's mostly uh, stable for animation. Um, if you give it a realistic video, it converts it nicely, it's, it's uh, stable. There's still some ongoing investigation about giving it Mont uh, images from Monte Carlo rendering noise. There seems to be a bit of a challenge there, but we we look into it. Um, basic idea is that for each of the points of the image, you you, you, you get um, some neighborhood of the of the pixel and divide it in a number of, of zones and um, pick up the color of the smoothest area and just replace color with that area and area you align based on the edge orientation in, in, in that area. So that's the, the basic idea. And if you follow the original paper of the implementation, it gives a very beautiful result. It's very slow, but it looks beautiful. And the other aspect is it's not really compatible with GP implementation. Luckily, you, there is this approach of some array tables, which is basically uh, optimization structure, which allows you to calculate the sum of, the, of pixels in, in, in the specific region very efficiently. So using that approach, you can speed up the calculation of variance for the areas uh, very, very nicely. Um, it still has downside that you need to calculate some base uh, essential for the entire image. So you might run into floating point precision issues on a GPU, but there are other tricks of offsetting uh, all the values by the mean value or by uh, 0.5. Like there are all sorts of tricks you can do. So that ends up working very, very well, and it's almost real time-ish on a GPU. Um, the next topic in, in, in the compositor is the procedural texturing. So we want to give control over um, artistic look in the, in the post-processing, for example, to be able to break uh, the sh uh, smooth edges of shadows uh, on, on a surface and somehow recombine these broken, broken shadows back to the image. It's something that not so, um, necessarily easy to do at render time, but it felt like it should be easy to do in Compositor with all those shadow linking, shadow uh, catcher paths and whatnot for early prototype. And okay, so how hard could it be to just add some noise to the essentially shadow pass? Well, you can if you go and create the brush and create texture for it, open another editor and start for the specifically texture node editor and have it side by side with compositor. It's possible, but it's clearly uh, cumbersome. Um, so it feels like, okay, so how it, it feels like we can make something which, more, which is much more straightforward for the artist so they don't need into all those uh, cumbersome workflows. So it turns out you can have early prototype quite easily, um, but 
it, it became apparent that there are some design challenges. Um, what the biggest one I would think is the fact that so far we are trying to convert the compositor system um, into strict left to right evaluation, which is the most easiest to understand for by artists. It's like, okay, so I have this image, that's what happens to it next, that's what happens to X next, and it, it's at any stage, you know, it's your resolution and, and, and things like that. The, the, uh, procedural texture and kind of, you can mimic the same behavior, but it kind of goes against of what happens in other uh, areas of uh, nodes in, in, in Blender. And the other aspect is currently in Compositor, it's only images which flow through the noodle, so you don't really have easy access to the bounding boxes of the uh, of, of your canvas at specific stage of the Compositor evaluation, which kind of gets in the way of getting the uh, strict left. Ooh. Okay, gravity works. Um, so, yeah, you don't, you, for, for, for module implementation, you'd wanted to have some uh, other data other than uh, floating uh, values or the, or the colors. And yeah, it's also on a, on a product level, it's like, okay, so do we value more like easiest way for people who are already work in the VFX uh, software to drop into Compositor and do certain things, or do we go prioritize more into integration with the node, other node, a system in Blender and uh, borrow their ideology and things like that. So that kind of brings us to the next steps which would happen, which we want to happen in, in, in this regard for the uh, compositor is to finish the, the design of the uh, procedural uh, texturing in, 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 in compositor. And like stuff I've already mentioned, and uh, something like I didn't talk before is like, okay, uh, we also probably want to be able to share node groups between different um, systems, node systems in Blender. And uh, that kind of adds uh, extra constraint to how we approach the design of the, of the tech, no, procedural texture in, 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 in Compositor. And one of the ideas is like, okay, so you can use the similar uh, approach in the geometry nodes, which is called fields. And for them, it feels like you can also like either allow this for the fields go right to left, for which you already have visualization tools, so maybe that will be an uh, answer to the confusion and making uh, it so that ours is always aware of what happens where, but you can also add like some inputs and make it more like left to right things, but it's all work in progress, so we are working on finalizing that design. Um, which brings us to the next topic, okay, GPU compositor, which, Basically, okay, potentially very heavy uh, project on the compositing side, so more performance, more better, like you, you, you can't go wrong if you, if, if you make something like 10 times faster, right? Um, so, okay, currently in Blender we actually have three compositors. One of them is the tile-based, it's um, what is available by default and it's implemented for uh, CPU and that's what uh, a lot of uh, people using this, like when they use F12 render. Um, there was a lot of work done for the full frame uh, compositor, which is still CPU only, which almost reached a parity with style base, but there are some differences and some missing features. But uh, the idea of it is that it's much more efficient for the, from the performance perspective. And we also have what is called real time GPU accelerated compositor or real time compositor, which is currently only limited to the viewport. So, yeah, why to have three compositors? So let's make GPU compositor the only way you are to sell a war because it's the fastest way. And okay, how do we go there? So yeah, as mentioned, like we want the GPU compositor be also used for the F12 renders and there is some um, initial work done for it under experimental options. So you can already benefit from it. Uh, for the missing nodes, a lot of work was done since the beginning of the project of the like the meeting for the goal project in Blender 4.0, there's like, it's not that many uh, missing nodes left to, to, to tackle and probably they're not that important for this project, but we still want to finish them. Uh, full float uh, precision is required to have for the proper uh, behavior of cryptomat passes. And it's not something that was possible in GPU before because of the 
a memory consumption and throughputs to the GPU perspectives and performance and whatnot, but um, work being made to support full float on a GPU compositor. Um, other aspect is that uh, currently in the three and the GPU compositor don't have access to passes. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, you, 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 you current, it's a bit hard because like um, some work was already done and it's like putting in perspective like what the timeline. Anyway, so it wasn't possible before and it's now possible in the, for the F12 experimental feature with the GPU composer, but it used ImageST, which is not necessarily most uh, efficient way because of all this round trips from the GPU to CPU back to the GPU. So the idea we have is that allow render result to have the uh, ability to have pass data as GPU texture on a GPU because while currently it's only uh, possible to have it on a CPU. So then, then you kind of have like more natural way it's like, okay, so that's your under result. Now you know what to do to feed it to the compositor. It handles it and it doesn't really care where things is coming from. And you can have good performance uh, without too much branching in the code. Um, the design is done. Um, just need some time to finish and implement it. And the remaining, the uh, another remaining aspect is the how the different composer handle canvas. For example, when you alpha over two different images with different resolution, what happens then? Or what happens if you if you rotate something, then blur, then rotate back? And before we started tackling the those points, it was all the composer would give different results. So now we kind of try to align uh, their behavior so uh, you can swap implementations much more transparent. Because if you, uh, if artists can use GPU composer on their workstations, on the side, you can use on a, on a render form because it might not have a GPU. So it should be a way to swap the implementation without uh, any regressions on the, on the, on the composition of, the, um, of your frame. So, yeah, the, for the future work is basically implement all the missing stuff which uh, I mentioned above. And uh, for now only have, like, remove the tile base to limit us to only two compositors, which already will be good, and probably eventually also go to a single, like, GPU-based compositor. And yeah, keep working on the procedural uh, aspect of the compositor as well. So, that's... All we have from like, you know, the tangible things which we've been working on and have something like other design docs or the um, commits done in, in, in Blender. There are still a lot of topics which are, so to speak, under development, which also uh, comes in a uh, requirement that, okay, we need to work with artist team because a lot of stuff is still unknown. Like, is it a topic? Is it like, how are we gonna solve it? Do you have everything for it? Like, do we put developer time on it? And it's just, I listed a few of them, which is like you've seen the ocean. Well, we need to simulate it, right? Okay, so what do we do for it? Is it just to just do geometry node simulation thing? Is it fast enough? I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure out. Um, other challenges, the underwater uh, shots where you would need to have cloth and hair simulation. It's like, okay, so uh, how, how that is going to work? Um, other interesting aspect is this abyss, which you saw, saw before. It has this alcohol ink effect, where like stuff like just pulls on it, like spreads out and whatnot. Like that's the idea, anyway. So how do how how, how do we do that? Like, is it simulation? Is it something would needs to be supported in geometry node? Is it something rendering would need to support to do proper water blending or something? We still don't really know, but we keep working on it. Um, and some other like just random topic I've overhead uh, in the context of NPR rendering is like, okay, so fo focus point control, right? Okay, so you want maybe, like if you just draw something, your artist might decide, okay, so remove details from somewhere, but then it's like, okay, like can this be done automatically or not? Is it required or not? Is it something which would be required for this movie? They'll figure it out. So for the updates, you can stay tuned at the studio org. That's where all those creative solutions, creative decision and progress will be shared. And of course, the project org is where like the Blender development is happening. And I would also like to give a lot of thanks to people listed on the slide. 
I'm not sure if it's worth going by the names, but thanks for their contribution. <laughs> and yeah, I don't have anything else. Okay, other questions? Uh, yes? Okay, so the question is if there's uh, CPU, compositing nodes that work on the CPU but that we cannot get working on the GPU. And I think the current answer is no. I think we can, I think all of them can work on the GPU. There's a few where uh, the implementation was done a bit different, like the glare node, it looks different, but arguably it looks better as well. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, it's none of the existing, well, I think none of the existing nodes have this issue at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Have you guys seen the SPU possibility of using a, um, such a slow texture that is basically uh, the width represents the unit space in the center of the stroke and then sampling the nodes of the reference? So, using that texture as a slow texture? I mean, I don't really know. It's like I only get to work with what Simon gives to me. It's like it's already like kind of ready geometry setup. It's like, hey, can we make this work or something? So we probably, but yeah, Simon said that's kind of what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more questions? There's one in the back. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the question is like, is it possible to keep the implementation on CPU and GPU compositor the same? So I believe so. Um, there is some uh, design investigation already being done. Okay. So how can you align it? And uh, from uh, Initial thoughts is that, okay, so the imp actual implementation of the nodes, it can be quite easily-ish shared, asterisk. Uh, on the, uh, but on the first like iteration of like the unifying thing, so it's probably will still be two different uh, scheduling mechanism because you might want to do stuff differently. We do the same thing on, on, on cycles as well. Their scheduling is done differently for CPU and GPU. And then, um, yeah, eventually it should be possible to unify even more. It's not exactly the highest priority now to spend a lot of time unifying it because you want to have like solve the artist side level first. There's a question over there. Um, no, I was mentioning I was mentioning a node texture editor because it's a different node system in Blender for texture nodes, which is not integrated anywhere else. So if you want to have procedural texturing in compositing, the workflow is that you add a texture node into compositor, and then you need to go to texture node editor and fill in the nodes there. And to create the texture, we probably also wanted to go to properties of a brush to create your new texture. So it's 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 a bit of a mess, but so it's kind of different uh, story from the layer textures. But that's uh, to my knowledge, that project is still somewhere on the table. Just waits uh, the developer time to be assigned to it. Yeah.
cycles where you need, for example, you want to apply the uh, shader to RGB or something like that. Now you are implementing a, a, a good way, apparently, to, to do NPR rendering also in cycles, which is great, I guess. There will be some kind of better compatibility between the two rendering engines. Uh, basically, uh, well, the question is if there will be better compatibility between Cycles and EV for NPR rendering, like the shader to RGB node, and the answer is basically no. Um, the, like, there's different approaches to NPR rendering, right? You can take, like, a more physically based render and then do uh, certain things in the shaders within that framework and then do a bunch of stuff in compositing, and that's kind of the approach here. We're not planning to do shader to RGB in Cycles. Um, it's not really compatible with the architecture and implementing it would be like another whole big project. So that's not really, not really part of this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, we have, I mean, we have thoughts about this. We have many issues about, I mean, we have I many ideas about this. It's unclear if in the context of this project it will become a priority. It might turn out that they're doing compositing and notice like it's, you know, it's not good enough and we have to improve it. Um, but yeah, at the moment it's, it's on our list, but it's not yet, you know, on our immediate list for this, I guess. Uh, Yes. Uh, so the question is if it's the same effect as in the Ninja Turtle movie. Uh, Similar. Well, I, I, I don't really know <laughs> how it's done in the Ninja Turtle movie, so I, I, I cannot really answer that. Okay. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know. Like the normals are coming from the geometry nodes, I guess, and maybe they they could do something like this. But I, uh, that would be more more for the artists. Okay, it's according to Simon, it does sound similar. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? I don't know, one of the microphone. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's are there more questions. Okay. No. Yes. Uh, well, so what do you mean exactly by cache? Because there's like, okay, so you, you can cache, uh, like the image is coming in. Like if you do an animation playback, you want to have like really quick loading of like your, your frames from disk. Um, so, uh, we, we haven't really, we haven't looked at that. And then the other type of cache is like maybe some intermediate cache where you have like a big node graph and you know, you want to do some change here at the end, and you don't want to like recompute the whole thing from the start. I don't know, like which. Yeah, for okay. Um, we haven't uh, looked at it uh, in the context of this, but it's. Uh, I mean, it would definitely be a good thing to do. Um, yeah, we'll see if the artists really ask uh, ask for it. Um, maybe we'll. We'll work on it then in the context of this, or maybe it'll be worked on in the context of something else. But yeah, it sounds like. Oh, because I have a slightly different, like, you know, priorities in this uh, aspect. Is like, okay, so caching is like, okay, that's kind of for the performance, right? So, and quite often people just add caching to solve some fundamental issue with the performance. So to me, I, I would rather say, okay, so if, if you modify something at the very, very beginning of the tree, make that uh, part real time. Uh, and then for a lot of stuff, uh, you wouldn't probably need caching. 
So then caching under to have like a second step. So first step, get the actual system uh, more real time. And then on top of that, just implement it. So it will come, it's more like, you know, matter of priorities and in, in, in which order you cache. Because if you start tackling, okay, so there is a cache and people need to wait for the cache to happen to see their result, it's not that useful either. Okay, well, thanks everybody. <laughs>